The Sweet Shop from Roald Dahl's Boy. On the way to school and on the way back, we always passed the sweet shop. No, we didn't. We never passed it. We always stopped. We lingered outside of its rather small window, gazing in at the big glass jars full of bullseyes and old fashioned humbugs and strawberry bonbons and glacier mints and acid drops and pear drops and lemon drops and all the rest of them. Each of us received sixpence a week for pocket money, and whenever there was any money in our pockets, we would all troop in together to buy a penny worth of this or that. My own favourite was sherbet suckers and licorice bootlaces. One of the other boys, whose name was Thwaites, told me I should never eat licorice bootlaces. Thwaites' father, who was a doctor, had said that they were made from rat's blood. The father had given his young son a lecture about licorice bootlaces, when he caught him eating one in bed. Every rat catcher in the country, the father had said, takes his rats to the licorice bootlace factory and the manager pays tuppence for each rat. Many a rat catcher has become a millionaire by selling his dead rats to the factory. But how do they turn the rats into licorice? The young Thwaites had asked his father. They wait until they've got 10,000 rats, the father had answered. Then they dump them all into a huge shiny steel cauldron and boil them up for several hours. Two men stir the boiling cauldron with long poles, and in the end, they have a thick, steaming rat stew. After that, a cruncher is lowered into the cauldron to crunch the bones, and what's left is a pulpy substance called rat mash. Yes, but how do they turn that into bootlaces, Daddy? The young Thwaites had asked. And this question, according to Thwaites, had caused his father to pause and think for a few minutes before he answered it. At last he had said, the two men who were doing the stirring with the long poles now put on their Wellington boots and climb into the cauldron and shovel the hot rat mash out onto a concrete floor. Then they run a steamroller over it several times to flatten it out. What is left looks like a gigantic black pancake and all they have to do after that is wait for it to cool and to harden so they can cut it up into strips to make the bootlaces. Don't ever eat them, the father had said. If you do, you'll get ratitis. What is ratitis, Daddy? Young Thwaites had asked. All the rats that the rat catchers catch are poisoned with rat poison, his father had said. It's the rat poison that gives you ratitis. Yes, but what happens to you when you catch it? Young Thwaites had asked. Your teeth become very sharp and pointed, the father had answered, and a short stumpy tail grows out of your back, just above your bottom. There is no cure for ratitis. I ought to know. I'm a doctor. We all enjoyed Thwaites' story, and we made him tell it to us many times on our walks to and from school. But it didn't stop any of us except Thwaites from buying licorice bootlaces. At two for a penny, they were the best value in the shop. A bootlace, in case you haven't had the pleasure of handling one, is not round. It's like a flat black tape, about half an inch wide. You buy it rolled up in a coil, and in those days it used to be so long that when you unrolled it and held it at one end at arm's length above your head, the other end touched the ground. Sherbet suckers were also two a penny. Each sucker consisted of a yellow cardboard tube filled with sherbet powder and there was a hollow licorice straw sticking out of it. Rat's blood again, young Thwaites had warned us, pointing at the licorice straw. You sucked the sherbet up through the straw and when it was finished you ate the licorice. They were delicious, those sherbet suckers. The sherbet fizzed in your mouth and if you knew how to do it you could make white froth come out of your nostrils and pretend you were throwing a fit. Gobstoppers, costing a penny each, were enormous hard round balls the size of small tomatoes. One gobstopper would provide about an hour's worth of non-stop sucking, and if you took it out of your mouth and inspected it every five minutes or so, you would find it had changed colour. There was something fascinating about the way it went from pink to blue to green to yellow. We used to wonder how in the world the gobstopper factory managed to achieve this magic. How does it happen, we would ask each other. How can they make it keep changing colour? It's your spit that does it, young Thwaites proclaimed. As a son of a doctor, he considered himself to be an authority on all things that had to do with the body. He could tell us about scabs and when they were ready to be picked off. He knew why a black eye was blue and why blood was red. It's your spit that makes a gobstopper change colour, he kept insisting. When we asked him to elaborate on this theory, he answered, you wouldn't understand it if I did tell you. Pear drops were exciting because they had a dangerous taste. They smelled of nail varnish and they froze the back of your throat. All of us were warned against eating them and the result was we ate them more than ever. 
Then there was a hard brown lozenge called the tonsil tickler. The tonsil tickler tasted and smelled very strongly of chloroform. We had not the slightest doubt that these things were saturated in the dreaded anaesthetic, which as Thwaites had many times pointed out, could put you to sleep for hours at a stretch. If my father has to saw off somebody's leg, he said, he pulls chloroform onto a pad and the person sniffs it and goes to sleep, and my father saw his leg off without him even feeling it. But why do they put it into sweets and sell them to us, we asked him. You might think a question like this would have baffled Thwaites, but Thwaites was never baffled. My father says tonsil ticklers were invented for dangerous prisoners in jail, he said. They give them one with each meal, and the chloroform makes them sleepy and stops them rioting. Yes, we said, but why do they sell them to children? It's a plot, Thwaites said, a grown-up plot to keep us quiet. The sweet shop in Landaff in the year 1923 was the very centre of our lives.